Good afternoon, future hackers. Welcome to the Linux training. Now, I'll just get, do a quick overview of what we're going to go over in the training today. First thing we're going to do is set up Linux virtual machines. Now, if you haven't set up a Linux virtual machine with Base Cyber before, I'll do a quick tutorial on how to do that. Then, I'll jump into tutorials on linuxjourney.com. Um, I'll cut this part out, I just wanted to check. Now depending on your level of expertise, um, no, cut that out, start again. I'm going to start with command line basics, get you familiar with command line commands. Then we'll move on to text view, basic text manipulation, and then use, user management, permissions management, process management, and package management. Um, and that's where we'll end off the training. If you are already well versed in some of these topics like the command line or user management, feel free to skip ahead. I'll go ahead and put some timestamps for the video in here if you want to skip ahead. Um, but don't do that just yet. After I go over all the trainings in Linux Journey, I'll head over to overthewire.org slash wargames slash bandit. And we will do a war game. A war game is basically a Linux machine on the internet that we uh, log into and do challenges on. So this will be a little bit of a capstone. Now if you want, you can go ahead, head over to overthewire.org slash wargame slash bandit and look at this yourself before we start so that when we start, um, because when we start, we'll be covering a lot of the things you'll need to know in order to complete the Bandit War game. So once you come across them, you don't have to wait for me to finish the training. You can just get started yourself. Uh, but I will, at the end of the training, be going over this and going through each level so you can see how it's done if you need that. All right. All right. If you've never set up a VM with Base Cyber before, here's how to do it. You have to go over to the Cyber Competitions Discord server, the main one that our organization uses. Down in BCL Community, you'll see a channel called Bot Commands. And in Bot Commands, as you can see here, in a few times, type percent sign get VM Linux, all lowercase. Uh, Quackbot here will send you a DM, and pretty soon you'll get a provisioning instance message. Uh, if you don't get that, contact base cyber admins, should get those technical difficulties worked out. And we'll just wait here for a minute. And eventually you'll get a message that says that has your Linux name, username and password. You just click here to connect. Make sure the link is legit. All right. Now, this is not usually what you'll get, 
if you do get this um, this portal instead of something else, which hopefully will show up, just go to the top right, hit log out. There you go. This is what I should be getting when I click the link. You'll type in a new password. And then it'll connect you to the guacamole instance. All right. Once you're in, you've got a full Linux desktop running in our infrastructure online. You can go check out files. You can open the internet browser inside your internet browser. It's pretty cool. For this, we'll just be using the terminal, which I'll tell you more about in a second, because we're going to get started on the command line. All right. Now, a little introduction about the command line. Um, the command line is basically a shell. Uh, a shell is a program that takes commands from the keyboard and sends them to the operating system to be performed. Performed. Um, now, if you used a GUI, maybe on Windows, maybe you type CMD on the search bar, or you've seen a if you use Linux, you've seen a terminal program. Uh, anyway, a terminal is a, a program that runs a shell. So if I click here, this this uh, terminal, this thing here is it's a shell that's being run. Um, so in this course, we'll be using the bash shell, short for born again. It's one of the most common. Um, I don't know if it's, I think it's the default for our Linux machine. I can't remember for sure. It shouldn't matter too much. There are others, um, but they all, they all have basically the same uh, functionality and features. So let's just start right ahead. Um, your shell should look like this. Um, with username, at hostname, colon, current directory, and then a little dollar sign here. Um, here we've got student. Student is our username, at symbol, a little hard to see. That's our host name, if you remember correctly. That's the same name that uh, Guacbot gave us. Um, that's the name of our host. Let's dash one. Uh, then colon, and then there's a little squiggly line, and then a dollar sign. We'll get to what that is later. All right. Now, this is called the command line. This is where we input our commands. So, on your own machines, I want you to try out this command. Echo, hello world. So just go here, type echo, hello world. And here we get hello world prints out. Pretty simple. So in class, I would ask you about this, but here we can just continue. Print working directory. Uh, this is our first or second Linux command, I suppose. Everything in Linux is a file. Uh, as you journey deeper, you know, You'll kind of understand that, but files are organized in a hierarchical directory she. The first directory in the file system is called the root directory. And the root directory has many files and folders, which stores more files and folders, etc. You've probably seen this plenty on whatever Windows or Mac computer you might use, or Linux. Uh, Linux also has a file explorer which is basically the same thing. Um, it opens up the file system. And here, if we click on file system, up here we see a little slash. That forward slash in a file system always indicates the root directory. It's the lowest directory. It's the one that holds everything else. All right. 
Now to see where you are in the file system, type pwd. Now on the command line, where am I? I thought I'd just type pwd and find out. Right, we're in home slash home slash student. So this first forward slash, that's the root directory. It's at the very beginning of the system. Um, and in the root directory, we're in the home directory, the home folder. Folder is the same as a directory, uh, just different name for the same thing. I'll show you here if we go into home. And then student is another folder slash directory. That's, that's essentially our home folder. Here in the file manager, now we're essentially in the same place in this file manager and in this terminal. All right, so now we found out we're at slash home slash student, home student. Now for CD, change directory. Now you know where you are. Now we can move around the file system. File system. Um, there are two ways to specify a path to follow when you're moving around the file system. There's an absolute path where you start at the root directory, which is a slash. Uh, for example, home, Pete, desktop. For us, it was home, student. That's an exact path. That says, OK, we're going to start at the root directory, and we're going to walk to where we want to go. So we're always starting in the same place. Relative path is the path where you, from where you currently are in the file system. Um, if I was in a uh, home student, I guess, I wanted to go to home student taxes. Uh, you don't have to do, um, for a better example, here there seems to be a music directory. So instead of doing home, uh, going to home student music, we can just go to music. Um, see that in a second because we're going to test it out. We're going to try both paths. Um, so it's just type to change the directory we're in, just type CD space, and then we'll start with the absolute path. So we're at slash home slash student. Now we want to go to music, which is in the student directory. So we'll just type music. And we're there. Uh, now in your command line, you should see a slash music uh, here. That indicates we are uh, in the music directory. Again, uh, I'll explain this tility, this squiggly line in a second. Um, though you can probably figure out what it is by now. Uh, now, in this folder, music, what do we have? Oh, it's empty. Okay. Well, of course, we can just try that again. From the home directory, um, well, I'm going to cut that out. Now, before we move any farther, there's a few things we should probably uh, go over. Um, it can get pretty tiring navigating with absolute paths and relative paths all the time. Luckily, there are some shortcuts. If you type cd space period, we move to our current directory. Space is the current directory. If we type cd space period period, we move to the previous directory. If we type cd squiggly line, that's the tilde, that's the tilde you see here, we move to our home directory. Basically, our home directory here is home student. 
um, it's basically a shortcut. So that's what our uh, shell types in instead of home student. Um, if we're at home student, it just types the tilde. And then last, not least, if you type cd hyphen, you'll return to the directory you were just in. I was just in home before I changed directory to home slash student. I didn't actually know that. That's interesting. All right. Once you've given all four of these a try, uh, we can go back into, we can try a relative path. We seem to be in the student directory. So if we type cd student, what do you think is going to happen? I spelt it wrong. We're back in our home slash student directory. Moving forward, ls. So we're moving around directories, right? How do we even see where we are in the command line without looking at the file explorer? Well, shine a light, ls, a light shed. I don't know. Look at this. Look at all these folders here. Um, and they seem to be the same folders in the file manager. In the home student directory, we've got bash crawl. We've got bash crawl here. Public, here's public, videos, etc. It's very useful. Now, if we do ls and then a path, if we do our home path, home directory, it prints out the same thing um, because you can print out a specific directory without being there. Now there's one very useful flag in ls, and that's the slot, the hyphen a flag. You should always do this if you're looking for hidden files. If you do dash a, it'll show you the hidden files. Well, look at all these. Where do these come from? First off, you see the period. Now the period is directory period is also listed that that just points to the current directory but it's still listed and you've got two periods which is also just pointing to the current directory and all of these names that have a period before them are hidden directories um, anything with a name that starts with a period in Linux becomes hidden it means it's not shown in the file manager or with LS by default Okay, one more useful flag, dash L for long. It shows a detailed list of files in a long format. Um, it will show you detailed information. So if we just do ls dash L, here, what do we have here? File permissions, um, number of links, owner name, owner group, file size, timestamp of last modification, and file slash directory name. You don't need to know all of this. It's just um, when we get deeper into it, once you learn what the permissions mean, uh, what a user and group is, and um, timestamps, and that such, that would make more sense. But right now, we can just tell what we're looking at by the field at the end, which is the name of the file or folder. All right. Now commands, you, know, you probably noticed that we're typing a hyphen and then a letter a lot. These are uh, command options or flags. Um, and flags can be made in a few different ways. If you ever want to specify a flag, you're usually going to type the command name in a space and then a hyphen, and then you can do as many flags as you want in any order. It just has to be a vowel flag. So if we do ls la, it'll do 
long list and show hidden files. If we do AL, same thing. Moving forward, touch. Touch is easy. Touch creates an empty file. Touch my file. And if we do an LS, we already saw it pop up over here. We have my file. Easy. Um, touch can also be used to change timestamps. So if you if you touch my file and then do an ls l, um, it was last. You can see that it was last modified at the current time, um, which is 21:18, according to the virtual machine. All right, that's another useful one. Next useful command: file. All right, so let's go back to touch for a bit. Um, the file name didn't conform to standard naming. Like um, when I when I typed in my file, it doesn't have an extension. It's not myfile.png or myfile.mp4. It's just my file. Um, so in Linux, file names aren't required to represent the contents of a file. You can create a, a file called funny.gif that's actually a PNG and drive everyone mad. Um, now, file reveals the truth. It will tell you what type of file a file is, regardless of its extension. So, file, my file, is empty. It has no data in it. If I did a file my file.png it would tell me it's a it's an image file or something like that uh, all right moving right along what's next cat all right we're almost done navigating your files but here is how to read the contents of a file um, cat is short for concatenate it not only displays file contents, but it can combine, combine multiple files and show you the output of all of them. Um, that is used less oftenly, but still used. Um, we'll typically just use it to read the contents of a file. So my file is empty, but I'll just cat it for the hell of it. And nothing is printed out. So later I'll maybe we'll try it out with a file with data in it. Moving forward, less. Uh, you're viewing files larger than a simple output. Less is more. Less is, uh, it's similar to cat. It also reads file content, but um, what it will do is it will limit the amount it prints to the terminal window uh, and will allow you to scroll up and down. Uh, you'll see what I mean if you try it yourself on a file with a lot of content in it. Um, here with less, less has a lot of uh, functionality, um, but I suppose it would be good to give an example. So I'm going to use my secret Linux knowledge to fill my file with a lot of data. Don't look.
All right. Using my la magic Linux powers that you will learn soon, I have filled my file with data. Now let's see what happens when I cat my file. Oh, that was a bunch of A's. If I scroll up, I can see... Yeah, there's a bunch of A's in that file. Yeah. So my file is basically just a text file containing text. Um, what happens if I use less? Here, it looks like we start at the top. If I use the arrow keys, I can move up and down. If I press enter, I also move down. And at the very end, it's end. To quit out of less, just hit Q. Easy as that. All right, moving right along. History. In your shell, there's a history of commands you've previously entered. And you can look through these commands. Uh, it's really useful to just copy a command you already ran. So let's run history. And we can see the very beginning we did hello world, PWD, and all our CDs, and all this other weird stuff. Um, but, uh, you know what's much easier? Just hit the up arrow. Well, look at that. We just ran history. We have to hit it again. Less, cat. We're going up the list. And we'll go. And if I hit the down arrow again, I go down the list. Super easy. Just hit up or down. And you get to previous the previous or the next command you just ran. Um, also, if you want to clear up your terminal, just type clear. Now look at that. Uh, I, I I thought it. What what's the what's the big idea? I. Uh, all right. Well, I guess it is clear, somewhat. <laughs> um, there are more useful features in a command line environment, like tab completion. Um, I guess I can do a little example here. If I want to type ls home, uh, oh, I, I can't remember the name of my home directory. Let me hit tab. Uh, or, or no, I, I do remember. It's it says t, but uh, student's a long word, so I'm just going to tab. It will fill it in for me. Easy enough. It'll autocomplete based on what it finds in a directory, as long as it doesn't have any other files can, starting with those letters. Um, and we're wrong, there's a lot to take in, um, but you can go more in depth than these in your own time. Uh, now, now we can make copies of files. Let me show you how. Say we want to copy my file. CP my file my file 2. Look at that. Now we've got two files. And let's cap my file 2 to make sure it's the same. And if those random uh, print statements of A's tell me anything, they're the same. So when you do CP, the first argument is the file you want to copy, and the second argument is the file you want to copy to. Um, and it does, the second file doesn't have to exist, the first one does, of course. Now you can copy multiple files and directories using wildcards. Wildcard is a character that can be substituted for a pattern-based selection. Uh, this is a little advanced, but something like a star can be used to represent any string uh, or any any single character, any string. Just 
it can be used to represent anything. Um, if basically um, if I type cpm star then copy is going to it's going to take any file uh, named m named ma named mi it'll take the file could be named m and then 3000 zeros at the end it's going to it's going to uh, take that file and copy it um, cuz that's basically how the wow card works zero or more of any character um, and of course Now it looks like here it says target my file to is not a directory. So I think what uh, CP actually wants us to do is copy to a directory. But if we're given a file name and we're only copying one file, it'll say OK. I guess that works. So if we copy my file to our current directory, period. Um, of course, it gets annoyed because we're trying to overwrite my file. So, anyway. Okay, now what happens when we try to do a CP on a directory instead of a file? Um, if we try to CP music um, into downloads. Uh, slash R not specified, admitting directory. If you want to copy a directory, you have to have the hyphen R option, which means recursive. That means it's going to take everything in that directory and all of its subdirectories and their subdirectories and so on and copy it to downloads. Of course, there's nothing in music, so if we ls downloads, well, we get music um, because music was copied. Great. And last but not least, if you want to have more control over copying files, say we want to copy music again, but we already got music in there. So we don't want to overwrite any files that might be So we don't want to overwrite any files that might be in there. Um, oh, but it does it anyway because music is empty. Well, anyway, try it on your end. See what happens. So we can copy files. We can also move files. Moving is just copying and then deleting. So MV is used for moving files and also for renaming them. Um, so here's how you move and rename files. So say we want to move my file into downloads, we just move my file into downloads. What? Oh, excuse me. There we go. 
Yeah, you have to be careful putting the uh, hyphen in front of directories because um, that means the root directory. So that's how to move files. If we want to rename files, we kind of do the same thing. And if we want to rename my file two to my file, just move my file two to my file. Um, if you want to move more than one file, you can specify more than one file. You can also rename directories, but it looks like when you rename a directory, you don't have to specify the R option, the hyphen R option. So we want to rename downloads. We can rename downloads. Ouch, downloads. So there are other options. You can use I to make it interactive again. And if you want to move a file to overwrite a previous one, you can back it up and it will create an old version. <sighs> Covering a lot today. There's a lot of basic commands to cover. Now, if we want to make a directory, um, we know how to make a file. We can use touch. Now we're going to make a directory. Um, MKDIR is used for that. It will create a directory if it doesn't already exist. You can make as many as you want. And now we've got two directories, books and paintings. You can also create subdirectories. That's nice. Let's make books or cards blue. Oops. I need the P. I need the P option. There we go. And in cards, we've got blue. Oh, now we get to the RM. So right now we haven't talked about how to delete files. This is how you do it. Let's delete my file. It's gone. All right. You notice it's gone. There's no, uh, there's no trash. There's no recycle bin. Cache is empty. If you delete something from the command line, it's gone forever. Well, not really forever, but it takes a lot of, it takes some specialized uh, software to get it back. Um, we can talk about that in forensics. Okay. Usually there are safety measures put in place, so uh, you can't just delete every file you come across. Um, so if you do the slash F flag, you, it basically won't, the, the operating system won't warn you and say, hey, you can't do that. Um, now, if you want to uh, make it interactive and actually prompt before you remove any files, you can do the dash I command and be safe. And finally, RM dash R. That's how you delete a directory. It, it's really a recursive delete. You delete everything in that directory and everything in its subdirectory and everything in that subdirectory and so on. So if we do rm slash r books, nah, cards. Cards is all gone and its subdirectories. Um, hmm. You can also just remove directory with rm dir. That's its specific. That's its own thing. All right. Now, a little tip, everybody. 
Many of you have noticed a little tip Guapot, Guacbot gave us that says, do not run rm hyphen rf space forward slash on a production system. Well, if you're watching this video, you probably couldn't join us on the uh, workshop on Saturday, um, but uh, I might consider running that on this system just to just to show you what happens and why you should never do that ever in your entire career unless you want to destroy someone's computer. But basically what it comes down to is you're removing a directory uh, by force, which means don't interact with it, and you're removing the root directory. So that means you're deleting the entire computer, every file on the computer, permanently. No getting it back. That's why it's so bad. <laughs> That's why it's so dangerous. So anyway, never do that. Getting close to the end here, we've got the find command. We can use, uh, there's a lot of <laughs> directories in the system, what if we want to find one? Uh, we can use the find command. Um, type find, uh, the name of the directory, and then we can specify an argument. In this case, name is uh, the name of the file. So if we want to find a specific file, we just have to specify the name and the directory. Uh, or you can specify the type of file you're trying to find uh, with hyphen type. Uh, D is a directory. Um, so, say we want to find, uh, let's, let's make a directory called, um, blue, green, yellow. Hmm. Am I doing the command right? Oops. I always mess that up. All right. We've got a directory. We've got a layer of directories here. Now we want to find in blue a directory named yellow. And it gives you the path. We found it. Blue, green, yellow. That's going to be really useful, especially in the war game. All right. And now we've got the help command. Help has some... Linux has some tools to help you use a command or uh, check to see what flags are available. Um, basically, uh, Whenever you run a command, you'll encounter new commands all the time. There are certain commands that will help you learn more about them. So if we do help, the help command, and then echo that command we did in the beginning that just prints out uh, prints out data, it'll it'll write something as standard output, which is really what we're seeing here, and it has some options. So that will kind of help you learn how to use it. Um, and sometimes uh, the command will have a help page itself. Um, but in this case, I guess it doesn't. Usually you dash dash help or echo dash h. Um, but in this case, it doesn't look like it has any of that. Man is similar. Man is this, it's basically the same as help, but it goes into more detail. Uh, it, it shows you uh, the user's manual of a command. So, and this is uh, the official developer documentation, essentially. So if I type man ls, what I'm getting is the manual document 
written officially by the creators of the LS command telling you how to use it. And it gets a little bit technical, but if you want to figure out how to run any sort of command in the most detail possible, this is what you'd use. Just go ahead and press quit to quit. Almost to the end here. We've learned quite a few commands. If you ever are doubtful about what a command does, just use the what is command. It'll provide a brief description of the command line program. So if we do what is uh, echo. Echo, nothing appropriate. What do you mean? Hmm. Let's do what is cat. Nothing appropriate. What's so inappropriate about cats? Hmm. All right, well, maybe it's not on our system. Moving forward, commands can get really repetitive. Sometimes you get sick of typing ls dash a. So creating an alias is basically just setting a command that will run another command. So for instance, if I alias um, foobar and then I do an equal sign and then enclose the command I want to run in single quotes, then if I run foobar, what do you think will happen? It runs ls dash la. Here we can see in long list format and all the hidden files. All right. Now this won't save your command after reboot. If you want to save it after reboot, you need to add a permanent alias in this file. Of course, we haven't gone over text editors yet, so we can go over that later. Um, but the dot bash rc file, let's see if it's here, dot bash rc. That file is a text file, and if we print it out with cat, It, it basically runs at the beginning of the bash shell and it does a bunch of stuff but basically you can put any command in here you want at the end of the file and it will run on bash creation so I can do an ls at the very end of this file uh, if I edit the file and I put ls at the end then when I boot a new terminal up uh, I'll see the output of ls. Um, and you can remove an alias just by doing un alias. All right. Oh, lastly, these are the basics. There are a lot of Linux commands. It, this is overwhelming. It's OK. Take a deep breath gotten through the basics you can refer back to this at any time just look it up on the internet uh, there's tons of resources for this uh, now to exit from the shell just type exit or log out Okay, now that we've got some basic commands down and generally know how to use the Linux command line, let's move on to basic text manipulation and navigation. So, there's a little introduction here. You've been uh, familiar with many commands that uh, output text. Bring a new terminal back up. Output text like ls. So we're going to learn about input output streams. So 
I'm just going to run this command in the terminal and we'll see what happens. Not bad. I'm just doing control shift C instead of control C. And then I just remembered, uh, for those who don't know, if you want to copy something from outside the base cyber virtual machine and then put it into the virtual machine, you tie it, you uh, push down the short keyboard shortcut. <coughs> you use the keyboard shortcut. You use the keyboard shortcut control shift tab. Ah, uh, never mind. I'm not gonna. I'll just type it out. Echo. Hello world. Close arrow bracket. Peanuts. Dot txt. And we've hit ls. We've got a peanuts dot txt here. So what just happened? Um. What happens when we look into it? Hello world. All right, so you could probably kind of figure out what happened here. Um, echo hello world prints to the screen. So that makes sense. Um, so processes use input output streams to receive input and return output. By default, the echo command takes input from the keyboard um, and returns the output to the screen. So our keyboard types hello world and then it outputted uh, to our screen. Um, so the next part of the command, this close arrow bracket, is a redirection operator. It changes where standard output goes. So instead of writing to the screen, it's going to write to whatever comes after it. Um, so in our case, we typed hello world, and then I'll just call it a little arrow, um, and then um, change the output to peanuts.txt. And what happened is, instead of writing to the screen, hello world was written to peanuts.txt. And that's why we can see when we cat the file, you can see it has a hello world in it. Um, now there's another one, it's very similar, a another redirection operator. They're called redirection operators. It redirects input or output. Um, the double arrow will um, do something of the same thing. Let me show you. Double arrow peanuts.txt and if we cat it now there's two hello worlds so one of these arrows will simply write to the file and it will overwrite whatever is in it replace it with with its contents two arrows will write to the end of the file so it will add to the file's contents um, like what happened here It'll append it, is the word. Append, add at the end. All right, so that was standard out. Standard in can also be redirected. Um, we have different standard out streams. There's also different standard in streams, standard input. Keyboard is an input stream. But we can also use files and stuff from other processes. Now. Here we're going to do is run this command here. Cat, and then we're gonna do an arrow in the opposite direction. Peanuts.txt, and then we'll do an arrow in the same direction. Banana.txt. Now what happens if we what happens if we cat peanuts? All right, what happens if we cat banana.txt? 
has the same thing in it. So let's break down what's happening. Um, the cat command normally uh, takes, you send a file to it, and that argument becomes the standard in. Um, so nothing really different is happening here. Um, it takes a file, cat takes a file, um, uh, I suppose a better example would be echo peanuts.txt. No, but that does nothing. Okay. Well, all you need to know is this little left arrow here will redirect the input instead of the output. So cat, instead of taking peanuts.txt as input, it takes peanuts.txt as input, which is the same thing, but it's important to know that you can do that. And of course, cat, instead of writing to the screen, writes to banana.txt. So this output is written to banana. All right, now there's a standard error stream. Try to list the contents of a directory that doesn't exist on our system and redirect the output to the peanuts.txt file. Okay, let's try it. ls fake directory. And then we're going to output it to peanuts.txt. Oh, I printed out an error, but it didn't redirect it. Well, there's another stream to play called standard error. Standard error also outputs to the screen by default, but um, the two arrows don't do standard error. They do the left arrow was standard in, right arrow was standard out. Um, but if we want to redirect to standard error, um, we have to do, uh, put a 2 in front of our um, right arrow. Typically, um, and technically, it's written here, but technically when you do a, um, when we do the ls fake directory here, we're really doing ls fake directory 1 peanuts.txt because 1 is standard out. They're numbered. Standard in is zero, standard out is one, and standard error is two. See, no output. If we cat peanuts, we get the error message. Now, if you wanted to see both standard error and standard out in the peanuts.txt, you could do it with file descriptors. Um, typically you can just put peanuts.txt at the end on the other side of, on the right side of both of these operators and it should be fine. Um, but the AND1, this AND1 here, um, I think is specifying this uh, file here. Now it's nice, there's a little shortcut. If we want to output both to the file, we just do and arrow. Oh, and a fun little tip. The directory slash dev slash null, or the file, It's a file, it, it's always going to be empty, even if you write to it. So that's a good way to discard output and just ignore it completely. Now, piping and teeing. Now, we're, we're, we're plumbers here. We're going to play some Super Mario Bros. Um, let's just do ls-la directory. 
So this is the etc directory, which is right above the root directory. It's right here. It's got a lot of stuff in it. Very long list. It's hard to read. Instead of redirecting this output to a file, what if we could see in less? Yes, we can. If we take this and do a little um, uh, vertical line character there, and then uh, specify another command like less, now that output we can see it in less. So um, the pipe operator pipes output from one command into the input of another command. Um, this way we can bypass files entirely and just go from one command to another. It's very useful. Um, what if I wanted to write the output of my command to two different streams? That's possible with the t command. Um, so let's see what happens if we do ls and then pipe it to the t command. Um, and then t will take the argument peanuts.txt. What happens? OK, we see it prints out ls in standard out. And what happens if we cat peanuts.txt? Same thing happens. So it looks like what t did was it took the output of ls as input, and it wrote it both to standard out and the file I gave it. It's pretty nifty. Um, all right. ENV environment, environment variables. So if we type echo and dollar sign all uppercase home, look at that, it prints out the home directory. That's like if we type pwd. Um, that's the path to your home directory. Okay, what about echo user? Student, that's our username. Okay, where's this information coming from? Environment variables. If you type env, we see a list of all the environment variables defined in our current shell. As you can see, there's there's a lot. Um, pwd, home directory. There's home is at the home directory. Um, path, that's going to be very important later. Anyway, these are like these are like variables if you in, in a coding language. Um, just like in a coding language where variables are defined and a program would use them, environment variables are defined by a shell, and the shell can use them. So we can really set environment variables um, as we wish. The, uh, the important thing, though, is uh, in order to access environment variables, they can be named whatever you want, but in order to access them, you have to stick a dollar sign in front of the variable. Um, I don't know if it'll go over export. Um, export allows you to create environment variables. I'll just do that real quick. To create an environment variable, type export, and then the name, we'll call it my var, and an equal sign, and then in parentheses, whatever you want it to be called, uh, or whatever you want it to be equal to. We'll, we'll just do 3000. And now if we do echo dollar sign my var, prints out 3000. So we just defined our own variable there. Variables only last, variables defined this way only last um, until I until we type exit until the until the program closes essentially so if we want to if we try to view it again it's no longer there okay now for the cut command um, 
copy face this following command. Now once you do, add a tab in between lazy and dog. Okay, now that it has become relevant, I'm going to show you how to copy something from outside of the base cyber VM and paste it into the base cyber VM. So I'll copy this, do a control C, come over here. And what you want to do while you're clicked on your virtual machine, hit control shift alt. If you're on uh, Windows or Linux, uh, if you're on Mac, ask the admin team. I'm not sure. Um, hit Control V here, and then hit Control Shift Alt again, and here you can, you know, start copy pasting. Now, um, if you want to copy paste into a terminal, you have to do Control Shift V uh, instead of just Control V, because that's something else. All right, so we we're asked to uh, copy this. So I'm just going to add a tab here and then uh, I think, yeah, I think that's what we need to do. Now it was hold down control V and then tab. Okay, hold down control V. No, hold down control V. Uh oh, ah, what have I done? Oh, it's a bad idea. Uh, <laughs> uh all right, I hope they don't care too much. Okay, first command we'll be learning about is the cut command. It extracts portions of text from a file. All right. Okay, let's see what happens if we do cut hyphen C five. Q. Wait a minute. The Q. Ah, oh, that's the fifth character. Nice. Now it puts the fifth character. To extract the contents by field, need to do a little modification. Um, cut. F2 sample.txt. 
The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. Um, okay. What did that do? The F flag cuts... Okay, the F flag cuts text off based off fields. By default, it used tabs as delimiters. So ours doesn't have a tab in it, so everything was returned, essentially. Um, combine the field flag with the delimiter flag to extract the contents by a custom delimiter. So if we do cut hash F2 hash D, was it D? Yes. And we specify the semicolon. Fox jumps over the lazy dog. See, it takes the second field between the quick brown and fox jumps over the lazy dog. Nice. All right, so that way you can cut output and take the exact output you want, either by character or by field. Now for pasting, it's similar to the cat command. Merge lines together in a file. Okay. A new file with the following contents. Okay, I just made the file. Um, and combine all of these lines into one line. Paste dash s sample two dot txt. The quick brown fox all in one line. All right. Default delimiter for taste is tab. So now there's it's tab separated, but we can change it to just a space using a delimiter. There we go, the quick brown fox. Easy enough. Now we've got head and tail. All right, we've got a very long file. We may have to choose. All right, we need a very long file. So we'll cat ver log syslog. This is the system log for the entire system. And we don't have permission because I didn't do sudo, um, which we haven't covered yet. But well, let's just see what we can do. Uh, if you just wanted to see the first couple lines of this text file, head will by default show you the first 10 files uh, first 10 <laughs> characters of the file all right so for those who don't know sudo we'll go over this later but it allows you to run commands as a super user student here is a regular user um, but a super user is like an administrator of the computer um, like an administrator on Windows um, something like that so here we ran head as a super user um, and it allowed us to get the first 10 it allowed us to get the first 10 lines of the system <coughs> It allowed us to get the first 10 lines of the system log. Easy enough. Um, now we can modify it to grab as many lines as we want. So if we just want one, one line. Oops.
Okay, first line's empty, let's do two lines. There we go. That's the latest one. <laughs> the latest event. Or the earliest. I don't remember. The tail does the exact opposite. It gets the last ten lines. Um, another good option is use the follow flag. It'll follow the file as it grows. Okay. Maybe we can try it later. Let's do... Let's do tail. Alright. Now let's do tail slash f. <laughs> Maybe it'll update if we're lucky. I guess not. Whatever. Uh, to stop any process while it's running, hit control C. That's why we can't control C, control V in the command line. Those are used for other things. Okay. Whew. There's a lot to go over here. Let's go over expanding and unexpanding. In our lesson in the cut command, we had our sample.txt file contain a tab. Tabs would show a noticeable difference. Okay, expand and unexpand are really simple. What you do is you um, give it a file, and it will print out. It will expand. Will cat that file, except it converts all tab characters to space characters. So it's not really that important. It's just something. And you can unexpand by converting every space character to a tab character. Um, unexpand dash A. Oh, I'm just going to skip expand and expand. Join and split. The join command allows you to join multiple files together by a common field. So there's two files I want to join together. Okay, we got... They've each got one, two, three. Um, so we... I'm just going to make the file and then All right, I've got two files I want to join together. Let's see what happens. Join file one. Well, first I'll cat file one.txt and then cat file two.txt. And now I will join file one and file two. Look at that. John Doe, Mary Jane Doe, Mary Sue. It was joined at the numbers. 
They are joined together by the first field by default, and the fields have to be identical. If they are not, you can sort them. So how do we join these following files? You need to specify which fields you're joining. In case, in this case, we want field 2 on file1.txt, so I'm assuming fields are naturally separated by spaces, with this John being the first field and 1 being the second. And um, So we want field 2 on file 1 and field 1 on file 2. So the command would look like this. Join dash 1, 2, dash 2, 1. Okay. So dash 1 specifies the field of the first file. Dash 2 specifies the field of the second file. You can also split a file up into disparate files using the split command. By default, split them once they reach a thousand line limit. Simple enough. We have nothing that's a thousand lines, so try that on your own if you've got something that big. Okay, now the sort command is very useful for sorting lines. Um, <coughs> Okay, now the sort command is actually really useful. If you sort a file, it will automatically sort it in alphabetical order. So if we do a, uh, let's see, sample do.txt. If we sort sample 2.txt, we get the brown fox quick. As you can see, it sorted the file by um, as you can see here, it's kind of strange. In the example, they're sorted by alphabetically, bird, cat, cow, etc. But here we've got the first, and then brown fox quick. Um, now the reason for this is because of ASCII encoding. It seems that sort is sorting them by their ASCII value. And in the um, ASCII character value index, a capital T is less than a lowercase uh, any character. Uh, the capitals come before the lowercases. And here it looks also like um, white space or space bar. Uh, is lower than any letter. Um, you can do a reverse sort and you can sort via numerical value. Which is exactly what we did here. Um, what it does if so if we sort file2.txt by numerical value Ah, uh, whatever. Ah, <sighs> not too important. All right, there's just a few more I want to go over here. TR translate allows you to translate a set of characters into another. Example: translating all lowercase characters to uppercase characters. Well, this is a simple example. If we translate <clears throat> so what translate does is it 
continues to accept input from standard in until it's canceled. So if I hit TR, A through Z, change it to A through Z, um, and then we type hello, it turns into hello. If we type it'll, yeah, capitalize it. And then we quit out using C. The unique command is another useful tool for parsing text. Say you had a file with a lot of duplicates, like so, you want to remove them. Just use the unique command. Um, all duplicates, line by line duplicates, the duplicates have to be by line, um, will be removed. Um, unique can also count the occurrences of a line and place it in front of that line. So. There are two books before here. Now there's a number two right here. Um, if you just want to keep unique values and don't want to um, keep values with multiple lines, just do a dash u. And finally, to get duplicate values, it's the opposite, slash d. Unique does not detect duplicate lines unless they're adjacent. Uh, for example, you had book, paper, book. Um, unique would uh, if you had lines that weren't adjacent, like book, paper, book. Uh, unique would give us uh, book, paper, book article magazine. Uh, so. It will only recognize that they are not unique if they are. It only recognize if they're not unique if the lines are adjacent. Now to overcome this, we can just do sort. We can just sort it, and then do unique. Almost done here. Word count and new line. Oh, <clears throat> almost done here. Last week we've got word count and number of lines. So the word count shows the amount of words in a file. Easy enough. Here's the number of words. Here we've got the number of lines, the number of words, and the number of bytes in the file name. Here we've got six words, technically, separated by spaces. Three lines, 18 bytes. You can also check the number of lines in a file by using nl, and it will number them. Finally, a very powerful tool using the power of Linux regular expressions, or regex, is called grep. Grep is the most, possibly the most common text processing command you're going to use. Um, allows you to search files for characters that match a certain pattern. Um, this allows you to really customize the amount of text matching that you can do. So, using sample.txt as an example, um, we'll just uh, grep fox and see <coughs> and see what happens. Quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. Here is highlighted in red. You can also grep patterns that are case insensitive with the uh, dash i flag. Okay. So if we do dash i and then fox, 
it still grabs it. And of course, you can pipe other commands to grep. So if we uh, do env to list all the environment variables, and then we do a grep user, well, we don't get anything. We need it to be case insensitive. We get we get a bunch of user uh, lines. Um, so grep is pretty versatile. You can even use regular expressions, which if you don't know, regular expressions are uh, character formats that are used to match a pattern of characters. So if I do this again, except instead uh, we specify, um, we put in quotes, um, uh, U, we'll just do U and then remember that star character we had before? That's supposed to match everything, any character. Let's see what happens if we do that. Hey, look at that. It basically returns everything with a U in it. Except when there's a U at the end of a... No? It returns everything with a U. So here, when practicing your text foo, you've gone over a lot. Not all of it will be completely obvious as to why it's so important, but trust me, once you start, if you haven't started it yet, once you start Over the Wire, the Bandit War game, you're going to be searching and searching, and you're going to be, uh, you're going to need to And you'll need to format text like crazy to properly search everything in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, especially make good use of grep and piping. So, So at this point, uh, at this point, your knowledge should be fresh enough to start working on uh, various Linux challenges and use the Linux command line in a fairly proficient manner. Uh, you know how to traverse the file structure. Um, you know how to look at files, create, copy, edit, delete files. Uh, you know how to modify text and manipulate text. So using these skills, we're going to start um, using specific, we're going to start going over commands that have specific use cases. Um, and, we'll hope, and this knowledge will hopefully help you in um, And this knowledge will hopefully help you when you're attacking or defending uh, various Linux systems in the field. So let's talk about user management. So Linux, in any traditional operating system, there's users and groups. They exist only really for uh, access and permissions because you don't want every user to access every part of the system, usually. All right. Each user has their own home directory where specific files get stored. Our home directory, of course, is home student. Um, that's, where, that's where all our files are, and we have permission to write, edit, delete all the files in there. Um, system uses user IDs to manage users. 
um, and group IDs to manage groups. Groups are just sets of users with permissions set by that group. It's just a way of organizing. In Linux, you have users in addition to the normal humans that use the system. Uh, sometimes the users are system daemons that continuously run processes to keep the system functioning. Um, and what I mentioned before, one of the most important users is the root or the super user. It's the most powerful user on the system. Root can access any file and start and terminate any process. It can do anything. You should typically never do something as root unless absolutely necessary. Um, now, if root access is needed and the user has root access, is a super user essentially, they can run a command as the root user, which is one specific user. Um, they can run, run a command as root with the sudo command. The sudo command used to run a command with root access. Okay, so let's say we want to view a protected file. Let's do cat etsy shadow. Permission denied. Easy enough. We're not, we don't have the permission to access etsy shadow. Um, Now let's look at the permissions of that file, why don't we? ls dash la etsy shadow. So the permissions show the hyphen rw, hyphen r, hyphen, 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 etc. You might, you might not know what all this means, but you can probably surmise that r means read, w means write. So So as a basic explanation here, um, as a basic explanation here, the first hyphen determines whether it's a file or directory. You don't have to worry about that so much. The, fir the next three, um, the next three fields are read, write, and execute permissions. So, um, and the next three fields pertain to the user that owns the file. Um, the next three pertain to the group that the user that owns the file is part of, and the last three pertains to everyone else. Now if we look at the uh, user that owns the file, it's root. Root is the user, is the owner. So root can read and write to the file. Shadow is the group that this file is a part of. So shadow can read but cannot write nor execute the file and we are in neither we are neither the root user nor in the shadow group so we can do none of those things or at least we can use it but we can do the sudo command and view it anyway. Um, for those elite hackers, try to find my password. <laughs> um, moving forward, the root user is... Uh, <laughs> we talked about the root directory before. Now we're going to talk about the root user. Um, the uh... So you can run commands as the super user, the root user, with the su command. You can also do it with the sudo command, but su logs you in as the root user. Now our password is incorrect, so I don't know how it works. Uh, 
our password is incorrect. I don't know how the Guac machine password system is set up, so I'm not entirely sure how to log in as super user on this account. Um, but I can definitely still do sudo. And you can, SU actually stands for switch user. So I can switch to any other user just by typing their name. By default, it assumes you want to switch to the root user. Now you may be asking, how come you can run a sudo command, but you don't know the su super user password? That doesn't seem right. Well, if you see here, you, uh, there's a file called the uh, sudoers file, which essentially means if you are a user in the sudoers file, you get to run file, uh, you get to you get to run commands as super user. <clears throat> All right. Now we get into the real juicy bits. So usernames aren't real identifications for users. The user ID is used to identify users. Uh, to find out how they're mapped, you have to look at the uh, Etsy password file. So here it looks like we've got students, and then I think that is the user ID right there. Um, what you see here, the file shows you a list of users and detailed information. Um, each line displays user information for one user, and the fields are separated by semicolons. First field is the username. Here we've got root. And the second is the user's password, which is not really stored in this file. It's usually stored in uh, Etsy shadow, which we saw already. And um, we'll talk more about that later. Uh, so X just means it's blank. So the third field is the user ID. I was right, that's 1002 in our case. And the rest is the, the group ID, um, Gecko S fields, other stuff. Um, you've got the user's home directory, it's right here, and the user's shell. Here we're using bash, as expected. Now we get to see the Etsy shadow file. This is the treasure trove. When hackers are trying to break into a Linux system, they're looking for this. And they're like, oh, give me that sweet, sweet shadow file. Um, I'm tired, I think my sanity is draining. I'm gonna edit that out. Uh, don't let anyone know I said that. Um, So again, if you want to read the Etsy shadow file, you have to be super user. There's no other way. Uh, it's similar to the contents of Etsy password. Um, it's really similar to Etsy password, except we actually have a password in here. But wait a second. This doesn't actually look like a password, does it? Hold on a second. It's an encrypted password. Now we'll talk more about encryption. Uh... <clears throat> I'll talk more about encryption later, but I encourage you to look it up yourself because it is a very interesting and secure way to make sure no one gets your password. Um,
There's another file called the Etsy group file. It allows for different groups with different permissions. Um, if we cat it, it shows a list of groups on the system. Here we've got the student group. Um, it's very similar. <laughs> it's a similar to Etsy password and Etsy shadow. Um, here we've got the group name, the group password, which isn't really needed, group ID, and the list of users in that group. Um, most of these will only have one user in it, some of them have two. Like Google Studios has students. And finally, user management tools. Most, <coughs> Most enterprise environments are using management systems to manage users' accounts and passwords, but on a single machine computer, there are some useful commands. We can add a user, doing sudo add user bob, and then you have to add a password, and etc. We'll just add password. Don't ever set that as a password, please. Full name, Bob Schmo. Room number. Uh. Huh, this is kind of strange. Uh, I think this is specified on a... I think this is specific to our um, virtual machine. If we do a cat Etsy password now. We've got Bob. Bob Schmo. There we go. And we can delete him. <laughs> user Dell. Bob. These all require super user. Now he's no longer there. If you, if you want to change passwords, just type password. P-A-S-W-D. Um, so I can change my own password by doing pass wd student uh, current uh, I hope I can remember my current password. Is it simp? simp. <coughs> I hope I can remember. <laughs> and incorrect. Okay, so what I'm going to do instead is uh, break the computer. So what I'm going to do instead is a sudo password student. Um, in which case, I don't need to add my current Unix password because I am the root user. Haha! <laughs> so, I'll just add that. And I'm good. So, in this module, we learned a little bit about user management. Um, So in this module, we learned a little bit about user management. Oh, a long day. God, these are long. So in this module, we've learned a little bit about user management, how to get information about a user, how to change to the root user and do things as the root user, how to add users and delete them, and where user and group and password information is stored. So now we're going to move on to a nap. Whew. I'm going to have to cut out a lot of this. This is too long. <laughs> mm. 
Now we're going to move on to permission management. All right, so for file permissions, files have different permissions or file modes. Um, now if we go back to, I don't know why I didn't maximize this from the beginning. Now for file permissions. Say we ls-l desktop. So file permissions are listed in the left. I talked about them a little bit. There are four parts to a file's permission. The first part is the file type, of course. Um, I'll ta this, uh... God, I need to take a break. I can't, I can't do this all in one go. Shoot. Now that we've gone over user management, let's move on to permission management, which is pretty similar. So we talked about this before. Files have different permissions or file modes. Um, like when we do an ls-l, uh, we've got this little chunk of text back here that I explained a little bit. Um, I can explain again. There are four parts. The first part is the file type. Uh, which is noted by the first character. If um, in this case, desktop is a directory, it was noted by D. For just a hyphen, it's a regular file. Next three parts of the actual permissions. They're grouped by uh, they're grouped into three bits each. First three bits are user permissions, then group permissions, then other permissions. Um, so the first three are the permissions that the user that owns the file has access to. So that's the user Pete can read, write, and execute this file. Um, second is the group permissions, penguins group has the ability to read and execute the file, and everyone else also has those permissions. As I mentioned earlier, R means that the user can read the file, uh, W can, they can write to the file, and executable means that they can, if it's a program, only if it's a runnable program, it can be executed. And if it's empty, they don't have the permission. Now you modify permissions with the chmod command. Uh, so I'm going to make a simple file here. Touch my file and do an ls-l my, my file. So I want to give that file um, I want to give that file execution permissions to the user. So here's how we'll do it. chmod, we'll specify the user, and we'll do a plus saying we're adding permissions, and then we'll specify the execute permission, and then the name of the file. Now if we do it again, now we have execute permissions. Easy enough. Now you can add multiple permissions on a file, you can do uh, user and group. Here we're um, adding. Here we're adding permissions to the user and the group, and we're giving them write permissions, which they already have. And another way is to do it in a numerical format. Numer numerical format is um, 
the numerical format is related to the decimal representation of the three bits. Um, if the bit is a zero, it doesn't have the permission. If the bit is a one, it does. So if, um, so if you want to have add So if you want to specify permissions, you basically just add them together and that sets all the permissions together. So say I want to give something read and write permission, that's four plus two is six. Um, say I just want something to have read and execute, that's four plus one is five. And if I want to have all three, that's seven total. So this example, change mod 755, that should change it to rewrite execute for the user, read and execute for the group, and read and execute for all other users. And that's what happens. And it's kind of broken down here too, if it's a little bit confusing, you can go to this uh, Linux Journey website yourself and read through it. Uh, seven is four plus two plus one, so it's all the permissions together. So not only are there access permissions, there's also ownership permissions. You can modify group and user ownership uh, using the ch own. So my file is currently owned by a student. Let's change the owner to Vinay. Now it's owned by Vinay. You can also change group by chgrp. to make it owned by the shadow group. Boom. Now if you want to modify both user and group ownership at the same time, just add a colon and have the username and group name right there. Now there can only ever be one owner of a file at a time. so. Uh, that's why you only see one in the field. Uh, permission bits are a great way to uh, great way to hack things, but no, it's not very important.
So the rest of this information, the UMass, set UID, set GID, sticky bit, are all very specific, and I don't want to go over them today, but um, I would call your attention to set UID uh, for any of you that are interested in Linux machine hacking, because if uh, the way it works is set UID allows a file to be allows a file to be executed by one user but run as a different user so a file could be executed by our student user but run as root so that could be a security risk if not implemented properly so I'll let you look into that yourself Now with that being said, uh, that should be the basic information about permissions you need to know. Let's move on to processes. Processes are programs running on your machine. They're managed by the kernel, and each process has an ID called the process ID. Simple enough. So if we do PS, we should have a list of processes running on this, cert this, uh, this machine right now. Here we've got bash. The bash process is what's running this terminal. And we've got ps, which is what we just ran right there. PID is the process ID. Time to live is the controlling terminal. TTY is the terminal that's controlling, that's controlling the process. Stat is the status code. Time is total CPU usage time, and command is the name of the command. Now there's a few options we can send to the ps command. There's A, which displays all processes running, including ones run by other users. U shows more details about processes. And X lists the processes that don't have a TTY associated with it. They'll show up with a question mark. The most commonly daemon processes at launch and system startup. So I'm going to run ps AUX. And we get a lot of things. We get more information. We can see who owns the process. We can see um, time for it and um, question marks and everything. And here's bash with the TTY PTS zero, which is ours because we've also got the latest command run PS aux. Again, this is just a summary of the fields that we just saw. Um, the important things you need to know are the process ID, the user that ran it, and the command itself. Um, luckily, PS is a little messy, so um, there are useful tools that people have come up with, like top, htop, uh, etc., which, for instance, this right here is a real-time this right here top is a real-time tracker of all the commands running on the system with their CPU usage the user controlling it their PID uh, the command itself all that good stuff you can scroll up and down and just hit control C to escape So we've discussed how there's a TTY field. TTY is the terminal that executed the command. So 
two types of terminals, regular terminal devices like we're using right here, and pseudo terminal devices. Regular terminal is a native terminal device that you can type into and send output to your system. It's basic. Okay, now let's just <clears throat> Okay, now let's just discuss controlling terminals for a minute. So the TTY field is the terminal that executes the command. There's two types of terminals, regular terminal devices and pseudo terminal devices. Now, you may think that this may be a regular terminal device. Um, well, it actually is not. And I don't know if I can do this on the virtual machine, but I'm just going to try it. Um, Go ahead and hit Control Alt F1. I really screwed up this time. Come on. Okay. Okay. Oh, grave mistake, ladies and gentlemen. Do not hit Control alt f1 if you're actually running a Linux operating system outside of this Linux virtual machine. Uh, whew. It's scary. Look, just in a typical Linux operating system, if you hit Control alt f1, you get into TTY1. It's a virtual console. It's, it's, a, it's adjacent to the desktop. It's no graphics, no anything, just a terminal. And uh, you can exit it with Control R, Control Alt F7. Simple enough. Um, now a pseudo terminal is what we're using here. They emulate terminals with a shell terminal window, and are don't and are denoted by uh, PTS. Now you notice how our TTY is PTS. Uh, so that indicates that we are in a pseudo terminal instead of a regular virtual terminal.
Oh man, I'm exhausted. This is so long, bro. Uh, I, I really should have thought this through. Um, okay. Moving forward. Now, <clears throat> now, there's a lot of things about processes that Linux Journey covers in great detail. We don't have to go into too much detail, but there's some that I want to cover. First is the kill command. Kill command is a, sends a signal to terminate a process. Um, so if you simply want to uh, stop a process from running, type a kill and then the process ID. So if I were to, I'm not going to do this, but if I wanted to kill um, this bash process, I would type kill and then uh, bah, 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 just checking. I would type kill and 3803. Like that. Nope. Now the second thing I wanted to mention is the slash proc file system. Slash proc um, contains process information and it's actually a very interesting um, file system. And um, as you can see here, there are numbers these directories all pertain to process IDs. If we see 3803 is a directory here. Let's check it out. Here we've got information, lots of information about the process. Anyway, that's the last uh, important thing I wanted to let you know about. Uh. Okay, so you've been through the ringer. You've learned command line commands. You've learned how to t You've learned command line commands. You've learned how to manipulate text. You've learned how to manage users permissions and processes. The last thing to do is to give you a tool to obtain Linux tools all on your own, uh, particularly hacking tools that will be very useful in the cyber competitions coming up. 
In order to download software on Linux, what typically people what people typically do is they use package managers. So, your system is comprised of many packages such as internet browsers, text editors, media players, etc. These packages are managed via package managers, which install and maintain the software on your system. They are not all installed through package managers. You can commonly install packages directly from their source code. However, the majority of the time you'll be using a package manager to install software. Uh, most common variety of packages are Debian, uh, <coughs> packages are typically linked to their distribution of Linux, so Debian packages are .db, Red Hat packages are RPM, um, Debian is used in Ubuntu, Linux Mint, basically Debian based Linux distributions. Red Hat style packages are seen in Red Hat distributions. Um, packages are really just lots of files that have been compiled into one. They're basically just pieces of software. Um, People that develop the software are known as upstream providers, and they compile code and regularly update it, so you can download it um, through a package maintainer or a package manager, um, which basically automatically installs and updates the software. So, if you want to download a package, you could just go to the download page of each uh, package and hit download. So, say I wanted to download Google Chrome. Well, we could do that. We could um, go to Chrome's website, hit download, and then install it. But package repositories are probably much better. There are a central storage location for packages. Uh, there are tons of repositories all over the internet and the and Linux doesn't know exactly where to look for these repo repositories unless you tell it. Um, So package repositories are basically hosted by <coughs> package repositories are hosted by um, package developers all over the internet, and um, for Debian, uh, package repositories are listed in the Etsy apt sources .list file, and that's where your machine will look and uh, check for source repositories. As you can see here, we've got security.ubuntu.com, um, central archive, uh, you know, a bunch of things. Now, before we get into package installation, 
uh, something useful to talk about. Now before we get into packets installation, something useful to talk about would be uh, tar and gzip. Um, so tar and zgip are file archivers. Um, they're just the same as .rar files and .zip files. And they're an archive of files that are compressed. Um, gzip is the program used to compress files in Linux and with a .gz extension. Um, pretty simple. Um, say we want to say we want to compress banana.txt. I'll just type gz gzip. I'll type gzip banana.txt. And now we've got a banana.txt.gz. And all we have to do to unzip it is g unzip ban banana banana.gz.txt and we get that back we get it back <sighs> unfortunately gzip can't add multiple files into one archive which is why we have tar when we create an archive using tar it will have a .tar extension um, now tar is an ardent tool of itself uh, say we want to compress the documents folder. We're going to do tar and then C for create. C for create, V for verbose, and F to tell the file. Uh, <clears throat> and F to specify the file name of the tar file. Now the tar file that you're going to be making, documents.tar, must come after this. And we're just going to put documents inside. Uh, that's a lot of files and documents. To extract the contents of a tar file, just replace the C with an X and send it the tar file. Okay. Now I'm going to stop this because this is too many files. Um, anyway, just cancel that and then rm documents tar. Now, typically, you'll see files um, with the extension .tar.gz, right? Now that is a combination of tar and gzip. In um, that's a combination of tar and gzip. Compression. And to show you how it works, you type tar um, c v z f yeah, tar c z v f um, the file you want to make tar dot g z in our case, and then the file you want to compress. So we just compress the music file. And to get it back, just replace the C with an X. <sighs> 
Now I'm going to edit this out of the video, but I heard once that a way to remember how to extract tar.gz files is uh, through this phrase, uh, x for extract, z, uh, z stands for, uh, well, <laughs> let's, let, let's see how I put it. Um, if you ever want to extract a tar.gz file, type tar extract z vucking file. Easy. You'll encounter other types of compressions such as vzip2, zip, unzip. You just need to look up the command for it. It's pretty simple. Hmm. Now, finally, RPM and dpackage. I guess they're making us learn about the, uh, the, the, the Robins of package management before the Batmans. A little bit annoying, but um, RPM and dpackage are all right but they're not the best. Um, .exe is a single executable, so is .deb and .rpm. You normally wouldn't see these if you use package repositories, but if you download a .deb or a .rpm directly, um, you install them using rpm and dpackage. Um, they will install the package files directly, but they won't install package dependencies. So you would have to install them separately and it will be a bit complicated. Oh, to install a package, you just do. Um, if you want to install a package on um, our computer here, Debian, just run dpackage i and then your package.deb. RPM is the exact same thing except with RPM. I stands for install. And if you want to remove it, uh, dpackage slash r for remove or for rpm slash e for erase apparently and you can also list install packages with dash l or dash qa rpm and dpackage hopefully you'll never have to use but information's there now finally yum and apt yum is the red hat package manager and apt is the Debian package manager. Let's do it. Let's do apt install chromium. Chromium is the open source version of Chrome. Uh, also, installing packages requires sudo. And here, useful tip, Chromium doesn't exist, but Chromium BSU does. Just hit yes or no if you don't want to install it. And that allows you to install a package. Um, once it's installed, Now, once installed, you can remove it using apt-remove. 
also with a pseudo. And it will free it. Apt can also automatically keep your system updated. If we do an apt update, what it will do, sudo apt update, it will check all the repositories online that were listed in that repository file we noticed before and get all of the latest stuff. Here it says 108 packages can be upgraded. To upgrade, we do sudo apt upgrade and I'm not going to run it because it will take a long time but that is how you upgrade your system. Uh, finally, if you want to get information about installed package, just do apt show map and it'll give you the package, the version of the file, description of it, etc. This is very crucial. It's one of the biggest things, one of the best things about Linux, and it's great. Uh, we don't have to worry about compiling source code. Um, if you ever have to compile source code, if you ever have to compile a program from source code, um, may God help you. Uh. All right, congratulations for sticking with me for this long. You've come very far. You've learned about user management, permissions, basic process management, and packages. And of course, you've learned the basics of Linux. And the only thing you may not have mentioned, is because I forgot to mention it, is text editors. If you type nano and then a text file, it will open up a text editor where you can, you know, use arrow keys to move around and uh, type your text. And down here, it shows you how to save, how to exit. I'll just hit exit and in to not save. Anyway, with that piece of crucial information out of the way, I'd say you're ready to start the war games. Now, <clears throat> the Bandit War Game is a way to not only hone your skills in the Linux command line, but hone your, uh, do some actual, um, do some actual hacking and system reconnaissance that you'll probably find yourself doing in the competitions this year. So, let me get you started. The main bandit, uh, the main bandit war game server, is hosted at bandit.labs.overthewire.org. I do not suggest you visit this. Uh, I do not suggest you visit this domain on your main computer. Only do it through a virtual machine like the one we have on GCP, because people all over the world join the same machine and they may not be the nicest. Just a little warning. Um, you connect to Bandit using a tool called SSH. SSH is something we never talked about but it's fairly simple. SSH stands for Secure Shell And it is used to get a remote shell into another computer. So you have to connect to bandit.labs.org on port 2220, username is bandit0, and the password is bandit0. So let me show you exactly how to log in. Head over to your machine and in a shell type ssh. Um, band, uh, you'll type ssh. And then after that, you would type the username, bandit0, an at symbol, and the domain name. In this case, it's bandit.labs.overthewire.org. 
and then a colon, and the port. In this case, it's 2220. And then you hit Enter. <clears throat> All right, to connect to a remote computer, Oops, I made a mistake. Uh, when you type SSH, you have to specify uh, hyphen P and then the port name or the port number and then the username and then the domain. Then it will ask you, it will say the authenticity of the host can't be established. Are you sure you want to continue connecting? Type yes. And it has a password. Type ban, we'll type bandit zero. Nothing will show up on screen. That's fine. It's still typing in. It just doesn't show you. And if you did everything correctly, you should be in. Go ahead, read the instructions. Um, explain how it is. The way Bandit works is usernames usernames are going to be some game so in this case it's always going to be Bandit 0, Bandit 1. Levels are stored in the home directory slash Bandit and passwords for each level are stored in the Etsy and then Bandit Pass the Etsy bandit password directly. So that's the main gist of it. Each level you're at, if we check we're in bandit zero, if we do an ls, we've got a readme file, do ls.l and a pwd, we can get a feel for where we are. We're logged in as bandit zero and our user is bandit zero and we're in the bandit machine. Now let's see if we can ls home. Yes, we can ls the root directory here and as you can see And if you can see here, we can look for ls.etsy.banditpass. And we've got a list of uh, text files that seem to include bandit passwords. If we try bandit0, we should be able to see our own password. And our own password is band zero, of course. So that's pretty simple. Um, this is kind of just a way to get started. You hit cat readme. It gives you the password to the next game. And that's really all you need. Uh, what you'll do, you'll copy that. And then to exit SSH, hit exit. And then if you want to connect to the next level, do SSH, same as before, same port, except this time we want to connect to bandit1 at same IP. And it's going to ask for a password again. Now that password we copied right there, we're going to do control shin v copy paste hit enter and we're in. That should be enough to get started. If you need any help reach out to the admins and I wish you the best of luck. Happy hacking!